Stalin and the Great Patriotic War. In 1941, Stalin was still eager to avoid war and ignored the obvious build-up of German forces on the Soviet border, refusing to believe that Hitler would break the agreement and invade the USSR. He would not allow Soviet commanders to take sensible defence measures in case they provoked Germany. Hence, the USSR was virtually powerless when the Germans did attack. Stalin then blamed his commanders for the lack of effective defence. Several of them were arrested, brutally tortured into making confessions of treason and shot. In the first week of the war, it was commonly assumed that Stalin had some kind of mental breakdown. He retired to his country retreat for ten days without issuing any orders. There were later claims, not very convincing, that some of his Politburo colleagues briefly discussed the possibility of arresting Stalin. The USSR, it may have appeared, lacked leadership at a critical time. In analysis, the reality was less dramatic. Why is it true that Molotov, not Stalin, made the radio announcement that the USSR had been invaded? More recent evidence proves that during the whole period, Stalin was very active. He received a constant stream of visitors and drafted orders apart from two days when he may have been in a state of temporary depression. On the other hand, some historians believe that Stalin was silent during this brief period to test his colleagues' loyalty, to see how they would react, which, given Stalin's paranoid tendencies, is entirely credible. A sure sign of real recovery was his radio speech to the Soviet people on the 3rd of July 1941, in which he called for fierce resistance to the invader. The Centralisation of Power Having recovered his nerve, it was not in Stalin's nature to give up any of his personal control. However, fortunately for the USSR, Stalin and other Politburo members realised that effective decision-making was crucial. Decisions could not get bogged down in the usual Soviet bureaucracy. Speed and decisiveness were vital. The result was the creation of the GKO, the State Defence Committee. This was suggested to Stalin by Molotov and was set up at the end of June with full control over wartime decision-making and the entire plenitude of power in the country. Its decisions had the force of law. Stalin described the GKO as having all the power and authority of the state behind it. It met frequently and whenever it was thought necessary. GKO acted almost as an inner Politburo. The original members of the GKO were Stalin, Molotov, Georgi Malenkov, Latvriente Belier and Clement Voloshilov. It was simply superimposed on existing systems but crucially it had the power to bypass complex bureaucracy and ensure that quick and flexible decisions could be made. Each member of the GKO took responsibility for a particular sector, such as the armaments production. Sometimes GKO left business to committees once decisions were taken. If necessary, when meetings were held, a particular expert might be co-opted into the discussions. The discussions could range from economic policy to military strategy, from ideology to foreign policy. GKO took direct responsibility for the defence of Moscow in 1941. Before the war, Stalin's personal power had grown, and frequently he did not summon the Politburo, but dealt instead with individuals. This trend continued during the war, and indeed strengthened. The Politburo and other party organisations met infrequently. The centralisation of control in the war did not prevent some conflicts between different bodies and individuals, and did not mean that all issues were quickly resolved. War causes disruption, and sometimes the notorious fog of war prevents the central administrative and command structure from knowing exactly what is happening and where. In the USSR, it could not always ensure that orders from Moscow were carried out as intended, particularly when communications were disrupted. This problem was made worse by the fact that during the war there was a rapid turnover of local officials. Inexperienced officials had to show initiative in the absence of direction from above. For example, local party organisations sometimes took over the management of enterprises such as factories. Military leadership The centralisation of the state administration with its flaws as well as its advantages was reflected in the direction of military operations. At the start of the war there was no centralised military command which could coordinate the response to the German invasion. Very quickly, two days after the German invasion, Stavka, the Soviet high command, was created. From August it was led by Stalin, the supreme commander. Stavka also included Molotov and the heads of the armed services and its meetings were attended by the GKO representatives. Stavka directed strategic and military operations. When decisions had been made, the details were then worked out by the general staff. Stalin's chosen method of running the war had important implications. Many historians believe that the Soviet system was much more efficient than Hitler's equivalent structure. Hitler operated very much as an individual, frequently paying off one general against another. Often acting on his intuition or personal hunches to direct events rather than relying on an organised command and administrative structure. Hitler often fell into rages when contradicted and increasingly surrounded by yes-men. 
He lost touch with reality and sometimes made disastrous decisions. Stalin was also capable of making major errors, such as his refusal to allow Soviet forces to retreat to Kharkov in 1943, resulting in encirclement and destruction in Germany's real last victory inside Russia. However, Stalin, while sometimes playing off individuals against each other, did learn during the war to take advice. There is also a clear principle from the start of the war that Soviet armed forces were under political control. This principle was reinforced by the reintroduction from July 1941 of the old Leninist system of having political commissars attached to army officers at all levels. This was to ensure political reliability and obedience to political directives. Stalin began to listen to more senior and successful officers like Marshal Sukhov. These generals were able to make a genuine contribution to military debate in a way that which Hitler rarely allowed. Stalin was still clearly in charge. He would decide who was to command which operations.